Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chris Howard. Um, as you can see, I'm the lead open source program manager at EPAM Systems. Uh, we're a software engineering company um, and a Finos member. We've contributed two solutions into Finos, so very excited to be here. Um, today I'm going to be talking about leveraging your organization's open source engagements to recruit and retain. Uh, that's the boring slide out of the way. Um, it, it's going to be quite a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? light slide, slide content. If you've seen one of my talks before, I don't put much on the screen. There's lots of chatting, so bear with me. Lots of emojis and a few words per slide, but we'll, we'll go through. Uh, so who am I? Um, well, obviously, this is my role, uh, but I also uh, am involved with Finos. So I sit on Finos's uh, diversity and inclusion special interest group, so trying to do a lot of stuff around uh, diversity and getting more people uh, into this space, uh, as well as I'm the chief learning officer for Open UK, um, so about kind of pipeline, supply side, education for young people in open source. So before we jump in, um, what am I referring to when I speak about open source engagement? Well, I'm talking about things like your open source program office, so your OSPO. I'm talking about open source solutions, open source contributions, memberships, partnerships, alliances, uh, and as well, very important, organizational culture, diversity, sustainability. So open source engagement in that sense, I'm wrapping everything up into one. So let's kick off. So why are we sitting here today? Well, it's no secret, I think, that the tech industry has a bit of a labor shortage at the moment, and developers are absolutely in short supply. We've had uh, the great resignation. We've had this kind of shift to remote working recently. We've got labor shortages, pipeline challenges, as I just re referenced. And of course, you've got the whole ongoing diversity and inclusion piece, which I'm very passionate about. So organizations really must start to react uh, and, st and shift the dial from this kind of, why do we want this person to work for us, to why does this person want to work for us? So that's the, the, the kind of question we're asking here. So what does this mean, and what does this have to do with open source? Well, I really believe that open source can be the secret weapon here. So leveraging your open source engagements, the topic of this talk, can be the secret weapon in what I'm calling the talent acquisition challenge of 2022. So that's where we're going with this. But it's not going to be an easy battle. Uh, and there's no industry quite as globally distributed as open source. So therefore, you're really competing on a global scale in terms of recruitment here. And don't take my word for it. Of course, Finos, members of the Linux Foundation, uh, they cited that in 2021, open source professionals had seen more direct recruitment and headhunting uh, in that year alone versus the six or seven that preceded it. So really, developers are in, uh, in demand here. And it seems, therefore, probably wondering why the fish, uh, that everyone is trying to catch a few fish in a very large pond. And in particular, uh, in the latest uh, open source jobs report, 86% of hiring managers tagged open source as a high priority in 2022. So the race is well and truly on. But where is this demand coming from? Uh, and in particular, a funny situation we're in, if some of us are on the edge of a recession, we're in the cost of living crisis. Well, we think 50% of it is kind of normal business growth. So organic business growth uh, leading to kind of a, a need to recruit. But the other 50%, we believe, is attributed to the rising adoption that we all know in uh, enterprise uh, open source. So open source has really been regarded as a strategic focus amongst businesses, uh, and we're all here today for the same reason. Uh, but we're seeing more and more reports and, and metrics around open source being a strategic enabler for organizations. And I spoke on that idea last year uh, at this conference. Uh, so if you want to check that on YouTube, please feel free to do so. But consequently, uh, it seems that business leaders therefore need to kind of wake up to three stark facts. One is that they don't have a pool of open source engaged employees in their organization, uh, and therefore they're unable to satisfy their own demand. Two is that they've been too slow in realizing this idea that open source can be taught, and you can kind of talk around upskilling and that later on. And three, that those with open source engaged employees have really underestimated the need for retention. And what they're finding is that their fish have consequently found another pond. So as businesses continue to operate in this period of uncertainty, and a focus on spending, uh, it's obvious that increasing an investment in open source, both through recruitment and retention, can deliver cost savings, innovation, and a real chance, I believe, to steady the ship. Organizations embracing open source are therefore really yielding the benefits. So, much like individuals wanting to work for organizations that offer certain benefits, great salary, healthcare, DNI policies, pensions, I truly believe that engineers are also actively seeking out businesses that are engaged in open source. And that's, therefore, what we're going to be talking about today. So recruitment. Why are we, why are we bothered? Why, why are we even bothered about this in the first place? Well, we're recruiting, I believe, to deliver against organization and open source objectives and vision. 
And that could be about growing communities, that could be about contributing upstream for business impact, it could be about embracing new technologies, new languages. And open source engaged employees and, are, and contributors are helping, ugh, and open source engaged employees and contributors are helping enhance business reputation in some of, I believe, the world's leading open source communities. And that's that kind of strategic value. That's where the real value here comes from. Contributing for business impact is the kind of the key message. Open source engaged talent also, I believe, are a bit of a unique breed. So they bring with them new heights of innovation, and they are excellent problem solvers, and they react to challenges and criticisms with reason. Open source engineers aren't afraid to push themselves outside their comfort zone, and are certainly coding in the open and putting their work on the stage uh, makes them a kind of real uh, talent amongst uh, other engineers. And an interesting point there is around that kind of taking criticisms with reason. We've all seen these issues on GitHub with long kind of flame wars and comments backwards and forwards. I think you get a, a real talent from an open source uh, maintainer, engineer, contributor. So open source talent try uh, hard, fail fast, but remain committed to the task at hand. And I really could go on about the benefits of, of hiring open source engaged individuals. But I also really believe that they provide a real benefit to enterprises as advocates. Those individuals that are living and breathing open source are key to establishing an open source culture and mindset shift in an organization. So many of you here today are probably thinking how to further your own open source uh, kind of objectives and engagement within your organizations. And I believe that these individuals, open source engaged individuals, are the key champions and allies to satisfying open source objectives. They'll bring new ideas to the table. They'll call out what they need and why they need it. They'll also say what they think isn't right and how you can go about remedying that. And this is why 86% of hiring managers are earmarking open source talent as their high priority that I referenced in 2022. So how do we reach them? How do we find these incredible people that we're alluding to? Well, unfortunately, there isn't a quick win here, um, but there are some kind of key things in terms of establishing yourself and your organizations uh, as kind of one of the number one considerations for engineers and open source talent. So I think the most important thing here is to have an open source presence that appeals to the people that you're trying to recruit. Now, as I mentioned around the diversity and inclusion piece, in that kind of industry, we talk about role models. So if I'm a young black woman coming out of university and I want to go and apply to a job and I don't see other young black women as role models in that organization, then I'm probably not going to want to work for that company. I can't see myself. The same, I think, genuinely can be applied to open source. If I'm looking to work in an open source engaged company, but yet everything I see doesn't mirror that, doesn't reflect that, then are they really engaged in open source? And I think that's a real nice translation that we can have between the two of them. Here we're talking about everything that's wrapped up in your open source culture, your organization, activities, and it's about making it visible. That's really important. It's about contributing or sponsoring projects that you want to recruit from. It's about engaging with organizations like Finos, the To Do Group, Open UK, that sit along the interests of the talent that you're searching for. And it's also, really importantly, about highlighting your commitment to open source, your open source program office in your careers pages and job descriptions. Additionally, uh, and I really like this one, this is about, this is my idea, but I really like it. <laughs> Think about the type of projects you're engaged in too. More often than not, I genuinely believe it's quality uh, over quantity here. Think about the types of skills that you're trying to hire and the kind of communities that those individuals exist within. So is your organization known, for example, about, uh, is known, for example, as being a real advocate or supporter of things like Kubernetes or Jenkins? Well, if they are, are you therefore engaged with those projects? Are you listed as a contributing member? Is there something visible that shows your commitment to that? Is there something your organization can offer those communities as well to really show your kind of allegiance and support of that and attract these people who are living and breathing in those communities? But also, and this is a really important point, don't see this idea about curating a kind of landscape as a, a kind of way of discounting those kind of left field or more kind of non-specific open source engagements. I think any projects that sit outside of your business scope still bring real value because what they show is a kind of innovative culture. They show an, uh, an opportunity to kind of explore and, and be engaged in exciting things above and beyond the kind of narrow focus. What I'm saying here is that your organization's open source engagement doesn't have to be niche but it shouldn't be sporadic or misaligned to what your business objective is. And too many times you'll see GitHub repos in the three, four hundreds, uh, GitHub orgs, with no real common thread. This is about saying, make sure that you're giving a concise, well-informed message across. And if your business objective, for example, is to ramp up engagement of a specific language to meet client demand, or perhaps it's to build a competency center around a specific solution to help with ongoing support and maintenance of perhaps some of the solutions and packages you're using, then this is what I mean when I say kind of reach out or recruit for influence. Uh, I hope this hashtag becomes uh, a trend. 
to kind of find the right people to, to fit the job. So it was only yesterday I saw that Amazon, in an article, have actually specifically been recruiting um, people prime, just with a sole responsibility to contribute upstream to Apache Kafka. Uh, so it's part of their business strategy. They're hiring people in, they're paying them a salary, and all they want them to do is contribute up. Now, you read more into the detail of this, why they're doing this. But what they want to do is they want to get more contributors into that project. They want to grow the community of that. That creates a, more of a, a less of a, a risk around maintenance, all of the things we've been hearing today around sustainability of open source solutions. So organizations are now realizing they can bring in open source engaged engineers and they can say to them, 100% of your effort, go and contribute back upstream. What does that provide the business strategy? Well, obviously lower costs, lower risk, real mitigation of some of the concerns there. So there's a really interesting trend happening now around not just 20% of your time in open source, we're actually bringing people to dedicate entirely in non-open source companies to contribute back upstream. Paying those salaries to individuals investing in that expertise, therefore is now becoming more of a kind of business norm. But what else can we do to recruit? Well. I think going a step beyond having a great website and lots of content and materials pushed out, I think here we're talking about getting kind of people on the ground. So this is about getting open source engaged individuals already in your organizations to go out and meet the new people that you want to join your organization. So this might sound simple, but pay for those open source engaged individuals to attend conferences, to go to dev meets and be visible. It's win-win, it's win for you, win for them. Secondly, provide those individuals as opportunities to be a spokesperson for your organization perhaps in place of someone who might normally be the person talking, why not let an analyst, a tester, a QA, whoever it happens to be, go and speak on behalf of your organization and show you their passion and commitment for open source. And similarly, make sure on that point that it's not always the kind of obvious business leaders or the open source program office that's speaking. Ironic, I appreciate myself uh, from my open source program office, but I think it's about giving a voice to those other people in the organization that can really tell, going back to that diversity piece, an authentic story about what open source means at your organization. And of course, I would be lying uh, if, I, if I said speaking here today also didn't come with an element of EPAM does open source too, don't you know? That's exactly the kind of low-level engagement I'm talking about, that me being here plants a seed that, oh, EPAM does open source, or oh, I saw this, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of on-the-ground conversation piece starts to lay the seeds, and then that's going to mature and grow into kind of the, the perfect recruitment opportunity. And there's a few more recruitment specifics too uh, before we move on to retention. And I really, really love this slide, um, as it's giving people the ability to kind of speak another language. You're showing potential candidates, for example, through your talent acquisition teams, that recruitment journey, that you understand them, you understand the open source space. And that could be very simple. That could be creating a one-pager for your recruitment team, a few high-level bullet points on what open source is. That could also be about asking the right questions at the right recruitment stage. Maybe saying, let's have a look at your GitHub profile. Do you have any Linux Foundation certificates you want to share? If you show that understanding as a, as a TA, a talent acquisition team or a recruiter of the people you're interviewing, then that's going to have a natural conversation and really show that this is a true representation of your open source engagements. And also don't miss the opportunity to reference that open source culture in things like job descriptions, specifically mentioning open source solutions perhaps that the organization's using and engaged in. That's going to jump out to the people that perhaps maybe are contributing to that project. It's going to make far things more attractive. And talent genuinely will be turned off if when asking open source questions at this recruitment stage, they don't get the answers or they get uncertainty. It doesn't show a kind of understanding. It doesn't show an authenticity around we believe and we trust in open source. You're, you're kind of putting a front on. So I really think there's some value in some of these high level, what, what we call a battle card for your talent acquisition teams around some of the key high level messaging. And finally, let's do it, say we've done all of this recruitment and it comes to signing on the line. I think there's real, real value, and I'm going to put my hands up, and EPAM doesn't do this, but there's real value in getting your open source policy out there in the open. So loads of organizations are realizing that actually if they can get that published, and lots of the hosting on GitHub or on the OSPO pages, then what you're saying is that you've got a giant flag saying, we do open source, come and read it, but it also shows kind of potential recruits that they're going to have a look at your policy, they're going to see what, what, what it allows, what it doesn't allow, how does it fit with their open source engagement, and really making sure that they don't come up against something at that final hurdle that then isn't compatible with them. So things like open source policies in the open, I'd love EPAM to do it, we're trying, but I think there's some real, real value there. Additionally, think about the employment contracts, and this is a real challenging one, and we could do a whole session on employment contracts. But you'll find, particularly in large organizations, that employment contracts are kind of standard out the box, 50,000 people all sign the same thing. And there's clauses in there over IP rights, over who owns what, over what's delivered during work time. And often these conflict with open source policies. 
Now, I really think there's value in kind of going back and looking at that, and typically you won't be able to, as an OSPO, rewrite your uh, organization's employment contract, but there are some success stories. But there are opportunities around things like exception clauses, uh, memorandums of understanding, agreements that can be applied, particularly in the case where you're hiring, if we think back to recruiting for influence, hashtag get, get famous. Uh, if you think about that and you bring your maintainers in, those are the kind of people who are going to be picking apart the contract to say, well, if I'm maintaining a solution or I'm writing a book on this or developing this code, there's absolutely no way I want my employment with EPAM to take ownership of that. So that's a really key part, and I think there's a whole, whole new session on that. So we've wrapped up recruitment, and we've got all these people about to come through the door. So it all sounds great, they're here, but, but how do we keep them? How do we keep those fish in, fish in our pond? Well, this is about retention. So the Linux Foundation found, there's lots of these Linux Foundation uh, stats throughout this presentation, uh, but you should definitely check out the Open Source Jobs 2022 report. It's got those of really interesting insight. Uh, but the Linux Foundation found that 73% of open source engaged professionals stated it would be easy, that's the key word, easy, for them to find a new role. So 73% of people working in open source in organizations have no concern tomorrow about jumping to someone who's done all of those great things in the recruitment thing, so that, that it's easy for them. But reassuringly, 67% of those people said they would stay with a salary increase. And 62% would be motivated to stay with a bit more of a training opportunity. So it's not, it's not an uphill battle here. There's some simple solutions, and that's why we call this out, that salary and training remain the top two retention strategies, not just in open source, but in the wider tech industry. So we're not going to focus on those today. I think that's key, and we, we all understand that. But what else can organizations be doing to help, therefore, retain open source talent? Well, I think following on from that idea of getting your policy out in the open, this is a key message. Make your open source documentation, your guidance, your policies, digestible. That's the, the burger reference, uh, if you didn't get that one. Have clear and transparent policies that outline how individuals contribute, can uh, not contribute, what restrictions exist, if any, ideal state, uh, and who to reach out to with questions. Think about the typical questions that individuals in your organization engage in open source will ask. So which projects can I contribute to? Can I use company materials? Can I use company time? Am I allowed to dedicate X percentage of my working hours to this? And also, really importantly, recognize that open source individuals are most likely on a daily basis collaborating, working, engaging in communities outside of their corporate world. This presents, in my opinion, a real risk to retention. You've got individuals living and breathing other communities, and if they're looking over the fence and seeing if the grass is green on the other side, these people are living it on a daily basis. They know what's going on. So your task, in terms of retention here, is doing all you can to make open source engagement simpler and easier, so that when they check if the grass is green on the other side, they actually go, oh no, it's, it's quite good here actually, I'm gonna stay. So all of these tips around retention are key to making sure that that big percentage we just saw, 70 something percent, don't just go, oh, it's easy for me to find another job because it looks more attractive on the other side. Now, training. I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but there's one key thing I wanted to call out, and I'm not specifically going to dwell on this too much because it's obvious, as we saw earlier. But there's a key message here around being proactive in kind of training and education opportunities. Organizations really have been slow to realize that upskilling, the idea of teaching open source versus intensive kind of courses, onboarding programs, etc., is an attractive proposition. And in particular, kind of training versus recruitment conversation, this is a key message. So providing succinct and relevant top-up ed education, if you like, uh, on topics that are interesting and relevant to your employees, I believe has real value to you and your organization. But recognizing, of course, that some organizations do require intensive open source courses, going through digital transformation, et cetera, and that's fine. We're not discounting that. Instead, what we're saying is there is benefit in taking a light touch approach, being attractive in offering kind of mini courses relevant to the individuals, but also that satisfy that changing business demand. So do we have client demands for a specific language? Do we have a real trend coming up that we need more people skilled in Rust or Go, for example? Let's do mini top-ups around open source contribution, what it means to be a good open source citizen. Let's not push people through a kind of six, seven module on open source, merge, conflicts, all of this kind of stuff that's not necessary all of the time. But at the same time, make sure to integrate it into your kind of standard onboarding. And I think you'll find that, that that's a really attractive piece around training. So similarly, Keeping talent engaged, though, is really important. So providing opportunities to work on exciting open source projects remains a real motivator and something that increasingly is becoming more obvious when we talk to engineers around retention. 
how can an organization therefore be bringing these opportunities to your talent's attention? So what can we be doing? What can we be doing to say, hey, there's a really cool project here and we'd love for you to get stuck in and contribute to it. What's the role of the organization in that? Think about mechanisms about how we can shout about those projects that you're engaged in, but also how to leverage those as a pull factor to bring in more open source talent. So in EPAM, we have a solution called Targeted Contributions, and specifically, as we were just hearing about sustainability in the other talk, we identified a number of projects that are strategically valuable for us. Perhaps we depend on them. Perhaps we're using them in internal systems. We have found a way to pull out, very simply, issues from GitHub into an internal platform that we have within the organization, Targeted Contributions, that's our catchy name, and then we present them to our engineers, and we say, these are some great open source issues we'd love you to solve. Now, of course, we'd love them to solve them because if, if no one maintains a solution, our systems are going to fall over and it's all going to go wrong. They don't necessarily need to know the, the, the end to end. That's, that's not what we're focused on. What we're saying is we've identified this as a really exciting opportunity for you to contribute to open source, and we're going to handhold you and take you through that journey. So it's doing as much as we can to make contributing to open source, giving back, easy. So all of those things we spoke about, now we're physically saying, here's a, here's a JIRA ticket go and work on it. We're doing all the hard work, we're doing all the ranking, all of the algorithms, etc., to pull through those issues, and we're giving them the work on a plate. Additionally, though, what about the role of the OSPO in this? So things like contributor CLAs, so contributor license agreements, pipelines, CICD, all of this kind of stuff. The OSPO can try and eliminate all of those challenges, particularly in the financial services and regulated industry, around gatekeeping and security checks and compliance. Really empower your OSPO to try and minimize those challenges. Developers don't want to be coming up against kind of signing agreements on all of these challenges if they're contributing. You've done the hard work getting them to pick up the ticket and work on the issue. You then don't want them to have to jump through lots of hurdles. And that's a key thing about making things digestible. If not, the fish are going to go to another part. And finally, if you make contributing easy, not only will the individuals contribute more, and hopefully your overall organization's commitment to open source will grow, but you're really minimizing that risk of frustration, and ultimately, what we're here today, the risk of attrition. So, this is absolutely one of my favorite things to talk about. So, reward and recognition. We're talking here more about salary, though. This is about differentiating between simply paying talent to do their jobs, but instead actually recognizing their achievements and efforts. 27% of employees who resigned in their exit interviews, in not, not at EPAM, caveat, 27% <laughs> of employees that resigned said it was specifically due to inadequate recognition of accomplishments. So here we're talking about, and I'm going to rattle off a few things because I, I love this, this topic, but we're talking about things like what tools do you have in place to track open source engagement in your organization? How are you rewarding, if at all, open source engagement in your organization? What do rewards for open source engagement look like? Is that public recognition? Is it financial bonuses? Is it sponsorship? Is it going to a conference? What's the right fit for your organization in terms of recognition? And is it different to your existing recognition routes? How does open source feed into annual reviews, peer assessments? Are resource and people managers aware of the additional engagements outside of delivery roles? Do you know who the maintainers and contributors within your organization are, even if they're working on non-open source solutions? And finally, are you championing and shouting about employees' open source engagements outside of their normal day-to-day -day and being proud about it? Have you identified a key maintainer who's just done a big release of their open source solution that's got, I don't know, 5,000 stars in GitHub, nothing at all to do with EPAM? Are you doing a press release or a little tweet or something to say, congratulations, Steve, on XYZ? These are the kind of things that say, actually, we get open source, we appreciate your efforts, and we're going to actually recognize you for that. All of these are super powerful and are really key to making talent feel valued and, more importantly, wanting to stay in the business. So we've covered a fair few areas uh, around kind of keeping talent in your business. So we've talked about transparent and digestible policy. We've talked about training and upskilling through to helping target contributions. And of course, recognizing those who are doing that to keep them engaged. There can be quick wins, small effort, large scale solutions, et cetera. But it's about finding the right match and then realizing and benefiting from that. But make sure that you do do that, as otherwise, it's easy, remember, it's easy to find another role. So make sure we do do this, otherwise the employees will go elsewhere. And finally, don't, don't think that you're in this alone. The Linux uh, Foundation reported that only 7% of hiring managers expressed no difficulty in retaining staff. So the 93% of people are experiencing challenges uh, around this. So in summary, we've covered getting talent into your business and how to keep them. We've recognized the, the hygiene factors, if you like, of open source engagement and recruitment, salary, training opportunities, recognition and policy. But we've also covered these kind of value add layers, the engaging and exciting industry projects, providing upskilling and latest trends and tech, and all of the stuff around rewards and recognition. 
So I genuinely believe that if we take these lessons learnt away, put them into practice, we might just start help. Uh, we might just start to help stem the challenges we covered at the bottom. We're not going to solve the demand and supply issue, but what we are going to do is make our organisations the attractive kind of place for open source engaged talent, make our clients happy, keep the world a, a better place. Thank you very much. Any questions? Sure. Yeah, it, so in EPAM we don't have metrics uh, on this at that stage, but what we do have is we have metrics that within the business that we show exactly who's contributing and engaged in open source. We can then track back through and say, were they doing this before, etc. And, and something we're really excited at the moment is trying to identify at point of entry into the organization, who are those contributors, maintainers, and then following their journey. And the tool that we use in-house that we've built and ultimately we're going to try and productize that, but that's a sales pitch for another day, um, is, is really an, allowing us to see every single individual's contributor kind of open source life. So every contribution they make, every repository they commit to, every kind of project they're involved in, irrespective of whether it's EPAM or not, it's showing their open source profile. And we can then go all the way up uh, to the organization level and we can see every single contribution every single commit, every single push event. It's crazy, it's super exciting, but what we'd love to do on that metrics point is be able to say, oh, I don't know, Steve over here is working at uh, IBM, we're gonna recruit him, he's doing loads of stuff in, in open source, he, we're not recruiting from IBM, by the way, um, and we're gonna pull him through, and we're gonna see what happens when he joins EPAM. Do his contributions change? What does his pattern look like? That would be so exciting to see if we're really kind of eating the same dog food around saying we're passionate about open source, enabling it, but then Steve joins and he stops contributing to open source, so what, what have we done wrong there? So. Yeah, yes, and uh, It's a good question. Yeah, so, so we, we actually had to raise that with our German colleagues because th they were really concerned about it. Um, in house, it's fine because it's, they've signed a, a policy as part of their contract, etc. But whether or not it goes into the wider world is a different conversation. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think it can be applied in the same way. Because, I mean, of course, inner source is taking, and I'm really going to simplify inner sourcing here, but taking all of the good stuff around open source and then just putting it in your, your walls and closing it down that way. I think everything that works in the open source world can work in, in inner source. What would be really interesting is if you differentiated between the two in terms of rewards and recognition, perhaps a bit of A-B testing and say, oh, the people that are engaged in open source, we're rewarding them in this way, the ones that are doing inner source this way, and start to see what happens. But the real value in inner source contributors is perhaps they don't even realize, but they're already open source contributors. So it's a very easy to push them over that fence and get them contributing externally as well. I think we've probably got one time for one, one or two more questions. Sure, go ahead. When you're in a company like that, that's what you're being told top down all the time. We know that engineers in finance don't necessarily want to go into finance, they're risking the failure of finance and going to work with big tech. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I wonder if you didn't really mention it here, but getting the alignment in financial services versus an engineering service, I think it's something you'd be quite poor with yeah. in financial services. And I just wondered if you your research has come into that. Yeah, I think I think that's a good question. And I think it kind of aligns to what we were talking about the talent acquisition team is that a lot of engineers that will come into financial services industry, for example, will be coming in, rightly so, because they're passionate about engineering and like the Python language, whatever it happens to be, but perhaps aren't super skilled in FS or necessarily passionate about it. I think there's a real part there in that initial stage of the journey, and perhaps it's around the communication, in calling out the kind of synergies between the two. So we're innovating, we're BlackRock's mission, we're doing all of this, et cetera. What does that translate to in terms of engineering? So again, shifting it into their language. So we're not talking about financial services as a big scary beast. What we're actually saying is that we're working on this really exciting, innovative concept that's using these technologies, but it just so happens to deliver financial products at the same time. Go on, one, one more question. How does it interact with your clients' policies given that you're a consulting organization, primarily for the people work? Mm -hmm. How does your office manage that? So encouraging contribution whilst delivering for clients. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So EPAM's policy is you can, you can use EPAM's materials, time, et cetera, to contribute to open source. There's no, there's no restriction. And we even pay financial bonuses for maintaining your own pet project. So if you're contributing to open source, it makes us look good, so we give you the money, it's fine, go and have a, have a great time. And we're really excited about that. For clients, yes, the challenge comes along, because what we're saying is we need you to be flat out 100% delivering here for clients, but we also really w want you to contribute to open source. And there's a fine line there between expecting people to be engaged in open source outside of their kind of contractual hours, outside of their client delivery, but still shouting about it, providing all these mechanisms for people to do it. What we don't want, the situation we've, we've really tried to avoid, is through these financial incentives, through these recognition awards, etc., is for people to say, oh, well, I'm going to do an hour's work in the evening on open source because it's going to get me, I don't know, X amount of dollars at the end of the quarter or whatever. So for us, there's a, there is a balance, definitely. And I think when you bring the client in, it just makes it even more complicated. I would love for us to be able to get all of our delivery and account managers up to speed and kind of do a Google model around attribute 10% of time, a bit like in sprint planning, 20% contingency for this, and be able to say, let's keep 10% aside for other stuff. But I think that's too aspirational. Clients, clients want the work done, and they don't really mind about what you're doing in the spare time. But it's a, it's a, good, a, good, a good challenge. Excellent. All right. Well, I think, I think we're done. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. Please feel free to reach out on Twitter or whatever.